two animal behaviorists, Maz Wong of University of Wollongong in Australia. Maz, thanks for yeah, being with us. Hi Katie, thanks a lot for having me. And Pete Buston of Boston University. Pete, thanks for being here. My pleasure Katie, thanks very much for inviting us. So Maz and Pete have spent their careers studying social behavior of fish, including clownfish. Now they have brought our attention to a very important matter. Finding Nemo is wrong. In particular about clownfish behavior. So I know it might come as, as a surprise to you that an animated film intended for young children did not fully encompass some confusing aspects of these fish's sexuality. Perhaps for reasons that will become obvious. For those who haven't seen the film, the first scene shows a mom and dad fish, Coral and Marlin, with a new clutch of eggs. In a heart-wrenching twist of fate, a barracuda comes and eats the mom and most of the eggs, leaving only one, which develops into Marlin's only son, Nemo. When a diver takes Nemo from his home, his dad sets out to find him. So I think Pete can explain this better than I can. In the real world, Pete, what would have happened to Nemo and his dad? Uh, well, if we start at the beginning, in the real world, uh, Nemo would have left home on his sort of own accord, and he would have uh, dispersed maybe a few hundred meters, a kilometer or 10 kilometers away from his dad. And they, um, the baby fish often leave home like that. Uh, so that would have been a completely normal thing for Nemo to do. What's not so normal is to have a controlling father who goes out looking for Nemo to bring him back home. Uh, in, in the wild, clownfish, adult clownfish never leave their sea anemones. It's very dangerous out there, and so uh, they don't want to run those risks. Uh, what's even more bizarre is that having got Nemo home, um, because of the way the clownfish social system works, um, in an unfortunate sort of set of circumstances, then uh, Nemo's dad would have actually changed sex and become his, I guess, mom now. But then Nemo would have matured and become a ma male, and th that would have been the only pair in the anemone. And well, then things would have got a little awkward. So, to clarify, too, Nemo wouldn't have been a boy or a girl to start out. No, I, when they're um, when they're tiny babies. Uh, they are neither, but they have the potential, and they will spend a lot of time as sort of not breeding. Um, the first half of their life is often spent as sort of non-breeders, and uh, but then they have the potential to be both males and females in their lifetime. And generally, they'll be a male first, and then um, when their mate disappears, they'll become a female and and start breeding with uh, one of the non-breeders in the anemone with them. So that's really different than how most kids might perceive the way the way clownfish behavior works right now. Um, yeah, I would love to make the sequel. <laughs> so Maz Wong um, published a book in 2011 called Sex and Sociality in Fishes, The Evolution of Social and Reproductive Behavior. So she is the perfect person to ask about not just clownfish, but a lot of other fish too. So when it comes to social and sex behavior, Maz, how do other fish compare to clownfish? Well, there's actually a lot of uh, fish, particularly coral reef fish, that form quite um, similar social groupings to clownfish um, in the sense that there's multiple unrelated individuals all hanging out in, say, a coral or, or some kind of habitat, discrete habitat like that. And what's really interesting about a lot of these fish is actually uh, this universal feature of a dominance hierarchy developing amongst um, the individual group members. So like the clownfish where you have the two monogamous breeders, uh, the biggest fish, um, there's other types of coral reef fish like coral dwelling gobies, for example, that also have two dominant breeders and several smaller non-breeders. And what's really intrigued Pete and I over the years is sort of why these um, smaller subordinate non-breeders tolerate being in these kinds of uh, social situations where they're actually reproductively and behaviorally suppressed by the dominance. So they don't seem to gain any kind of 
reproductive benefits from being in a group. Um, and it's just these sort of intriguing little questions that uh, we're finding these types of social coral reef fish really useful um, as model species to try and test some ideas for why these behaviors have evolved. To find out how these behaviors evolved, um, you'll have to read Maz and Pete's article in the July-August issue of American Scientist where they talk about clownfish behavior, coral-dwelling gobies, and um, some of uh, the other non-breeding behaviors that happen um, throughout the animal kingdom and how they might have evolved. Um, Maz and Pete, thank you so much for coming. Maz, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And Pete, thank you so much. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure.